I really am I really am proud of Jonathan, and God, God is just doing great things through our college ministry. And I know that God's going to continue to work through Jonathan's life as he joins Chris Cummings, who was our college pastor in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Chris and his wife and his family moved to Arizona to plant uh, Doxa Church, is the name of the church that's going to be uh, kicking off here later on in the, the year as they gather their kind of core team together. And so last week I was able to go and just spend some time with them and catch up with them. Um, we, we're their parent church. That means that we're like their supporting, sending church. And so we have an obligation to continue to pray for them and to support their work. And so I want to give you a quick update. So they have moved to Tucson. Kristen is working at the hospital, which is literally right outside the, the campus gates of the University of Arizona. And their house is in a neighborhood right next to the hospital and the campus. And so they're very strategically located. Uh, they're meeting people in the community, uh, meeting people in their neighborhood, and really learning the, the vibe of the city, learning the culture of the city, making connections. And uh, the plan is that throughout this spring semester, they'll continue to develop that core team uh, as they get ready to launch. And uh, we expect that um, God's actually going to send some people from here, uh, people who are actually planning to, to move from Galveston to be part of that team uh, that we'll see uh, in the next couple of months. And then God will, will continue to bring people from other places, but then also the people that are there in Tucson are going to be a huge part of that church. So we'll be praying for the, the Cummings family. Um, Jonathan will make that transition um, in June is, is the, the game plan for him. So we've got him for a few more months. And then we've been in the process of searching for our next college pastor, and I've got some great news. Uh, we found him, uh, and his name is Cam Risby. Uh, this is a picture of Cam. Um, that is his wife, by the way. He's not just, uh, like, holding her. Um, <laughs> they, they were playing, like, hide-and-go-seek or something. He just caught her. He, like, tag you. Yeah, I think she likes it. Um, um, her, name is, her name is Lenny. Uh, she was actually born in Mexico and is bilingual, um, which is pretty cool as we get ready to launch Coastal and Espanol and what, as well. So uh, they just bring a lot of gifts to the table. Cam and Lenny both have been on staff with Campus Outreach, which is a college ministry that we've partnered with for the past several years. Uh, if you've been around Coastal for a while, you know that Campus Outreach in the summers will bring about 60 to 80 college kids uh, here in Galveston for an intensive discipleship and leadership training program. And so they've actually come to Galveston multiple years through campus outreach and have been a part of Coastal in the summers. And so they're very familiar with their church, very familiar with college ministry, uh, even here in Galveston. And they're awesome people. And I'm so excited for Cam uh, to join our team. I think they're going to fit in great. I think you guys are going to love them. And uh, I'm, I'm working very diligently at my staff basketball team. And uh, Cam's about 6'3". And, and look, I needed a power forward. I, I got the center covered, but I needed a good power forward. I think he's my guy. So we're going to be challenging the Methodists and the Episcopals. And, you know, our staff basketball team. It's going to be a great tournament, but I think we got a good shot. So... None of this is in my notes, by the way. <laughs> this is just, y'all just getting all this for free. Um, college ministry, seriously, is one of the most strategic ways that we can invest in the next generation. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but a lot happens in a person's life from the time they turn 18 to about 22. They're making some really critical decisions. And you have kids who've grown up in church who really for the first time have to decide, is faith going to be something that I own or is this just something that my parents were into? So they're going to have to decide as, as young adults, they're going to own it. But then also, it's just such a critical time because people are making choices about the direction of their career. Uh, they're oftentimes dating and, and the the person that you end up marrying ends up being like a really big deal in terms of the, the direction of your life. And so there's so much that happens in that window of time. And historically, some of the greatest movements of God in our nation have come 
started by college students. Really, uh, that, that age range, God has just used that in some powerful ways. Uh, if you are kind of a student of history, you may have heard about the Great Awakening uh, in the early 1700s, kind of mid-1700s. Uh, you got guys like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield were preaching, and uh, the, the, the colonies really came alive in terms of faith, and thousands and thousands of people uh, turned from their sins and really... Turn towards Christ. It's a huge part of our nation's history. And then we saw that again in the 1800s, um, really kind of mid-1800s, right before the Civil War. Um, There's another great awakening, and that's where you see guys like like Dwight Moody, uh, and even the YMCA was founded during that time. Uh, Most of us don't realize this, but YMCA is more than just the song. Um, (laughs) it, It actually started as the Young Men's Christian Association and had a very social services type of bent to it that was overtly Christian. It wasn't just like a kind of generic place where you just go work out and play racquetball. Um, it, it really was a Christian organization and it met needs during a very difficult time in our nation's history on the brink of the Civil War. And so God, in the middle of that darkness... There was this, an awakening. And then you, you saw that again in, in the 20th century with the Jesus movement, and the Jesus revolution in the, the 1960s, late 60s and early 70s. And some of you guys uh, maybe would say, hey, I remember that. Anybody would say, hey, I'm old enough to remember that, like a couple of you guys? Uh, there's a movie out, actually, that came out uh, this weekend. So if you weren't there for it, but you could, you could still learn about it, you go see the movie, and I've heard great things about it. Um, I, I've heard it's way better than Ant-Man. Um, <laughs> so you got a choice. You can go watch Jesus or Ant-Man. Um, my kids picked Ant-Man. Um, <laughs> but but here, here's the deal. Um, there's a real sense that God is doing something special in our nation right now. Like there is a, a hunger for him. And if you've paid attention to the news, you may have heard about something called the Asbury Revival. Uh, it's happening in Kentucky, and it's a Methodist seminary and college. And uh, what happened was a group of students had normal chapel. I mean, it was just a normal kind of chapel service. And a few of them said, hey, we really feel compelled. Let's stay and pray and worship and just be in the presence of God. And there were no big name speakers. There were no uh, lights or smoke machines or bands that you've ever heard of. It's just like some college kids uh, hungry to be in the presence of God. And uh, God just showed up in a way that was very tangible for them, very powerful. And that became... Um, something that they didn't want to stop. And so people kind of kept hearing about it. Uh, I've got friends, actually, that have served uh, on staff there at the university and just hearing stories about how people literally canceled their classes to say, hey, God is doing something really awesome in the, the chapel. Let's go. And, and so it just started snowballing. And as people started to hear about it, people literally from around the nation started to come <laughs> And so you have about a two-week period where this small little town, um, Asbury, Kentucky, you have all these people coming to this place because there was a hunger for the the very manifest presence of God. And and here's the deal, guys. Um, We believe that if you are a follower of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit resides in you. Like you have God's presence with you everywhere you go. You don't need two or more gathered. Like that's actually not what that passage means in Matthew chapter 18. It's about church discipline. Um, but God's presence is with you. Even if you were all by yourself in your deepest, darkest place, God's presence is with you if you have the Holy Spirit. And yet, and yet, there are times where God just shows up in a different sort of way, in a a special sort of way. And you could call that revival, you call that outpouring, but there are just times, and I've experienced this in my life, where you just know, you're just like, man, God just showed up, and his presence was thick in the room, and it was undeniable, and you just walked in, and you just knew that there was something different happening. And from what the reports are, that's pretty much what was happening 
in Asbury. Now, uh, if you pay attention to social media or online, there are always going to be different responses, right? There are going to be people who celebrate it and say, hey, this is great. There are going to be people who, who caution. They'll say, hey, listen, this is great, but let's be careful. And then there's going to be people who critique it. Uh, and I'm not so concerned about what happened at Asbury as I am here, because I know at the end of the day, we want what they're talking about. We want to be in God's presence. We want to see lives change. We want people to have encounters with a, a living Jesus who, who died for us and changes everything about our lives. We want that. And the cool thing is I think God wants that. I think God wants us to have those sort of encounters. And I, I think he's doing that on campuses. It's, uh, you have the Asbury revival. But then I'm, I've been seeing reports literally all week of God just doing some great things on all sorts of different campuses around the nation. Thursday was National Day of Prayer for college ministry. And it had been planned like months and months and months in advance. Like nobody, you know, could have timed this better. No one timed that the Jesus movement uh, revolution movie would come out this weekend. Like God is doing something in our nation. And it's a reminder that what really changes people, what really changes our lives, it's, it's the presence of God. It's, it's, it's God's word. It's his presence. It's the blood of Jesus that we sang about. Like, that's what, what does it. And, and guys, I love our building. We have a great staff. We got a great band. We got some really talented people. We got some of the best donut holes in the state of Texas. <laughs> but that won't change your life. And it won't change your eternity. Like, it really is your relationship with Jesus. That's what, what does it. And, and I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it in my life. I don't, I don't want you to miss it. I don't want our church to miss it. And so for us to really do that, like, there has to be a, a commitment and a seriousness to obeying him. And that's what this series has all been about, this, this idea that we're going to courageously obey him. And sometimes that is hard. Sometimes it doesn't make sense when we think about the things that God is calling us to do. But we trust that he is a good and faithful God and that he will carry us through and that his plans are always right and always good. And so we're going we're gonna to jump into a passage today that is not a passage that you've probably heard at Vacation Bible School. Okay, this is not one of the stories that you, you grew up hearing, um, but it is truth from Scripture, and it is convicting, and it is good. Okay, so Joshua chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get it open. Joshua chapter 7, if not, the words are going to be on the screen. Uh, you can follow along in your notes. But we, we pick up the story right after the nation of Israel successfully captures the city of Jericho. And, and that's the story that everybody knows. That's the story of the, the army marching around the city seven times and the walls come crumbling down. But before they captured the city, God gave the people some very specific instructions. He says, you're going to need to not hold on to the plunder. You're not going to keep the stuff that uh, is there. Instead, you're going to give that to God or you're going to burn it. But you're not just going to keep it for yourself. And pretty much everybody did that. Everybody followed the rules and followed the instruction, except for one guy. And we're going to read about him today. Okay, so here we are, Joshua chapter 7. We start in verse 1. And this is what it says. It says, the Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of what was set apart, and the Lord's anger burned against the Israelites. Now, the reason God wanted the items to be set apart were really kind of twofold. One, it would actually fund the treasury. Like the idea that, hey, we're going to capture this and then use it for our nation's you know, resources to be set up. But the other thing, that God was actually preventing the people from falling into idolatry. And, and many of the items that would have been left there in that ancient city would have been used for idol worship. And God was trying to protect his people 
from the, the pagan religion of the Canaanites. And so he says, listen, when you go in and you find all this stuff, you may think it looks cool, but I actually want you to, to burn it. Like, I don't want you to have anything to do with it because it might be tempting for you to follow in that path. Verse 2 says, Then um, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and told them, he said, go up and scout the land. So the men went up and scouted Ai, right? So they've conquered Jericho. Now they're getting ready to go on to the next city. But what's interesting here is in verse 1, we find out what Achan did. We find out that Achan kept some of the plunder for himself. But at this point, that's only something, that, that's a detail that the narrator has told us in the story. But Joshua doesn't know that yet, right? So he just thinks everything's good. Verse 3, it says, after returning to Joshua, they reported to him, said, don't send all the people, but send about 2,000 or 3,000 men to attack Ai, since the people of Ai are so few. Don't wear out all our people there. In other words, he had sent out the scouts, and it says, look, this is not going to be a big deal. Like, they're not heavily fortified. It's not a big army. We can just seem, literally, we can send the JV. Like, we can send a small group of guys to take care of it. Let's let everybody else rest, and then we'll move forward. And so Joshua thinks, okay, no big deal. Verse 4, so about 3,000 men went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 of them and chased them from outside the city gates to the quarries, striking them down on the descent. As a result, the people lost heart. Now, this was a, a very unexpected outcome. I mean, Think about this. The people of Israel had just conquered a walled fortress in Jericho, a massive victory. And now they're gonna, they've got a very easy battle, like easy battle. Hey, you only need to send a couple, couple thousand guys. Like it's not a big deal. You've got this. But there's an upset. The people put up much harder of a fight, and they end up losing. It's, it's the unthinkable that God's people, who have been promised by God to take possession of the promised land, show up, and then they lose. It's completely unexpected for Joshua. And you can imagine this, this kind of crisis that he starts to go through. Verse 6 says, Then Joshua tore his clothes, and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening, as did the elders of Israel. They all put dust on their heads, and they said, O Lord God, Joshua said, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to hand us over to the Amorites for our destruction? If only we had been content to remain on the other side of the Jordan. What can I say, Lord, now that Israel has turned its back and run from its enemies? When the Canaanites and all who live in the land hear about this, they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. Then what will you do about your great name? Now, something you need to know about kind of this ancient culture is that there was a close association with military victory and the glory of the God that you served. And so if a, a tribe has victory, then it's it's not just a victory for the tribe or for the people. It's, it's a victory for the God that those people served. And a loss is a loss for the God that those people served. And so here Joshua is, is saying, hey, listen, it's God versus the God of the Canaanites. And in Jericho, God comes out and he's the winner. Like he is the clear winner. God is the God. He's the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He's almighty. And now they go to Ai and they lose and Joshua says, hey, everyone's going to think that, that God, you're a puny God. That, that somehow their God is better. Like, what's, what's, what's happening here? You can imagine this kind of crisis of faith that he's having. Verse 10 it says, then the Lord said to Joshua, he says, stand up. Why have you fallen face down? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant that I appointed for them. They have taken some of what was set apart. They have stolen, deceived, and put those things with their own belongings. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They will turn their backs and run from their enemies because they have been set apart for destruction. I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart. Now this instruction wouldn't have been new news to Joshua because Pretty much God had repeated these same words before they ever started the battle in Jericho. He says, listen, if you want my favor to rest upon you, 
then you need to obey completely. You can't just obey partially. You have to completely obey, and you can't keep any of this. And so Joshua says, hey, somebody, somebody took what they should not have took. Like, he, he recognizes what, what happens here. And so verse 13, it says, Go and consecrate the people, which means to set them apart. It's a, a holy ritual. He says, Go and consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate themselves for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are things that are set apart among you, Israel, and you will not be able to stand against your enemies until you remove what is set apart. In the morning, pre- present yourselves tribe by tribe, And the tribe the Lord selects is to come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord selects is to come forward family by family. And the family the Lord selects is to come forward man by man. The one who is caught with the things set apart must be burned along with everything that he has because he has violated the Lord's covenant and committed an outrage in Israel. Now that is a horrifying scenario. I don't know if you can kind of actually picture this, but you have the whole nation... And basically, Joshua says, we're going to narrow it down to see who the guilty culprit is. And we're going to start with each of the 12 tribes. And we're going to go and we're going to narrow it down. And and once we get to the right tribe, then we're going to go kind of family units and kind of break it down after that until we finally figure out who it is. And then once we figure out who the guilty party is, then God commands us to burn them and to execute them. Did y'all hear about this in vacation Bible school? Was this, was this not one of the stories y'all covered? Um, listen, we take seriously scripture here. And so this is actually what we do at Discover Coastal, our membership class. Right? So you come. And, and you know, sometimes we'll have about 20 families show up, but only 18 leave. You know? Like that's, that's how it goes. Now Listen. So let's talk about this. Um, this seems extreme, right? Like uh, from a 21st century American worldview, like we're reading this, this seems really extreme. But in the eyes of God, it's not. Because God was protecting his people from the paganism that they were stepping into. There was a wickedness in the land. And in a way that they aren't just like, hey, they're just different than us, but the people literally practiced child sacrifice and some horrible, horrible customs. And God knew that if they were to intermingle with those practices, that they would be tempted to fall away. And so he, he wanted a, a level of purity, and he wanted to make sure that they, they knew what was expected. And so the consequences were, in fact, very severe. God takes those instructions seriously. So verse 16 says, Joshua got up early the next morning, and he had Israel come forward tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was selected. He had the clans of Judah come forward, and the Zerahite clan was selected. And he had the Zerahite clan come forward by the heads of families, and Zabdi was selected. He then had Zabdi's family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, was the tribe of Judah, was selected. They found the guy. We don't know exactly how that worked, if just the Holy Spirit made it it kind of obvious, but Joshua knew, like, hey, that's the guy. So Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make a confession to him. I urge you, tell me what you've done. Don't hide anything from me. And Achan replied to Joshua, it's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful cloak from Babylon, Five pounds of silver and a bar of gold weighing a pound and a quarter. I coveted them and took them. You can see this for yourself. They're concealed in the ground inside my tent with the silver under the cloak. Now, I'm not really sure if this really counts as a a confession. This is more of a confession after you've been caught, right? Like this is more like the police have you and you're in the interrogation room and you you just decide, hey, listen, I'm I'm just going to go ahead and confess. But... Achan confesses. He says, you got it right. I'm the guy. I took it. I know I shouldn't have done it, but I did. Verse 22 says, So Joshua sent messengers who ran to the tent, and there was the cloak concealed in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from inside the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out in the Lord's presence. 
Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver cloak, the bar of gold, his sons and daughters, his ox, the donkey, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought us trouble? Today the Lord will bring you trouble. So all Israel stoned them to death. And that was a a common form of execution where literally people would pick up large chunks of rock and stone and just throw them um, at the people. It was brutal. And they burned their bodies, threw the stones on them, and raised him over a large pile of rocks that remain still today. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger, and therefore that place is called the Valley of Achor still today. Now, let's just pray and go home, right? Now, that's tough, isn't it? Like th- this, this is one of those passages that um, if you're here this morning and you have serious doubts about the Bible and Christianity and you're trying to figure this out, man, you read stories like this and you say, how could Christians believe this stuff? How can they believe that God is a good and merciful God when you read this stuff? Like what, what even is the point of this? But listen, no scripture is wasted. All of it is inspired for our benefit. And I think what this story tells us is that as we read this story, it tells us a little bit about who God is, but it also tells us about who we are. Because the truth is, is that we are Achan. We are Achan in this story. And we are the ones who, who know the things that God wants us to do, but we don't bat a thousand. And we, we don't always do what God tells us to do. And oftentimes we, we fall short of that. And so if you're taking notes this morning, I want to give you a space just to jot down a couple things. I think this will be helpful for all of us. But like Achan, we covet what God prohibits. We want the things that God says, hey, this is off limits. But the world says, hey, this is really good and this is really fun. And that didn't start with Achan. It actually starts back in the Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve are there, and God says, you can eat from any tree you want, except for this one tree. Stay away from that tree. And what tree do they go after? The one tree that God says you can't have. And that's what we do. That's what we do. There's there's a lack of trust to believe that God wants the best for us, That, that somewhere deep inside of us, we think that God is somehow like, holding back from us, that the, the good stuff is, is he's keeping it from us, and that the world has it right. No, that's not true. Not at all. So we are like him in that we want the things that God prohibits. We also believe that we can get away with sin. And here's the truth, ready? You might be able to for a little while. In fact, you might be able to get away with sin your entire life. It's possible. No one may ever know about some sin in your life. You you actually may keep it a secret until the day you stand before the Lord. And then you and I will give an account for everything we've ever done. And there will be no more secrets. None. None of the things that we've thought in our minds, none of the things that we've said, none of the things that we've done. It will all be laid bare before the Lord. And accountability will take place. And so we think that we can get away with it. We think that no one will ever know. And maybe you will for a time. But sin almost always finds its way out into the public's light. Almost always. Maybe not every time. But a lot of times it does. And certainly from an eternal perspective, you will not get away with it. And like Achan, we underestimate the collateral damage. Now, I'm sure in the moment when Achan was ransacking Jericho and he sees the cloak and he sees the gold and he sees the silver, I, I, I can't imagine that in that moment he was thinking of anyone else except for himself. He said, man, this is cool. I can just take this. I'll bring it back to my tent. I'll hide it. No one will know. But 36 soldiers lost their lives because of Achan's sin. And not just the soldiers, Achan's family lost their lives because of his sin. Listen, we we always tend to underestimate 
the damage that our sin will do to other people. And that's what Achan does here. Now, some of you are here and you hear me say that and you think, yeah, um, I have been damaged by the sin of other people. And I've felt that. I've been on the receiving end of the, the consequences of decisions that other people have made. And that is true. Uh, my guess is that really all of us in this room have encountered that on some level at different points in our lives. But I actually want to push you away from thinking about what other people have done. And I want to ask you to draw the circle around your own life and think about your own sin. Because your sin, your brokenness, has affected others. It hurts others. And there's so much at stake. And then finally, like Aiken, we discover that confession doesn't erase the earthly consequences. Now, I think this is a, just a good time for us to just kind of have this conversation about the role of confession. Because confession is actually a really healthy spiritual practice. Um, not only do we confess our sins before the Lord, but the Bible tells us that there's benefit in us confessing sins to one another. Uh, and sin is most powerful when you allow it to remain in the dark. When it, when it uh, stays in secrecy, that is when sin has its greatest hold. But when you drag sin out of the darkness and you bring it into the light, then, then sin actually looks foolish. Uh, when you actually see sin for what it is uh, and you put it into perspective, sin looks dumb and it begins to lose its power. If you can imagine if Achan had confessed the temptation to steal a cloak and a little bit of silver and a little bit of gold, and he had just confessed that openly to one of his fellow soldiers, he would have been like, yeah, that's totally not worth it. Like, I, I'm, I'm not going to risk my life and the, the life of my family uh, for this. Like, this is dumb. It's a cloak. Like, why would I do that? And that's what, what confession does. It, it actually begins to put things into perspective. And as we confess our sins, it's the first step in repentance and turning away from sin. You cannot turn from your sin if you don't first recognize that the sin exists in the first place. And so God is never surprised by our confession. I don't know if you know that. Like, you can confess your sins here this morning, and God will not be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. No, he knows. He knows. But if you confess to a friend or to a spouse or to a family member, they may not know. And you know what? It is good and right, but it is also hard. And can we just be real about that? Like, that, that there's not this idea that, hey, listen, if I confess, hey, I confess, then you just have to forgive me and we have to move on. Like, confession is good and right, but it doesn't take away the consequence for the decisions that we've made. And so if you confess to committing a crime, guess what? The police may arrest you. Like, you may have to suffer some penalties. If you go to your boss and you say, hey, I need to confess. I have been violating company policy. You may lose your job. If you confess to a moral failure, uh, your friends and your family will be hurt by it. So confession is good and right. But let's be clear, it doesn't erase the consequences, at least in the earthly sense. But what it does do, it puts us in right standing back before God. And what happens in, in a person's life is that when you finally get real about your sin and you confess and you repent, you experience a weight that comes off your shoulders. Because sin is miserable. Like holding on to sin is really actually, it's just miserable. It's hard. And so the person who, who finally confesses or repents actually feels a sense of relief. Um, from carrying that way. But it doesn't change the fact that there are consequences. It doesn't change that fact. And that's true in Achan's life, right? So he, he's, he's caught, he's busted, he confesses, and guess what? He experiences the consequence of the penalty that God told him that he would experience. That's what happens. So, 
What do we do with a message like this? I mean, this is tough stuff. Well, um, by my count, I think you've got four different options. Um, I think you can hear this message and go, cool, uh, I'm not making any changes in my life. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. The other option would be to hear this message and to say, I hear it, and you know what? I ought to make a change. And then you kind of have this kind of spiritual moment at church, but then you just go back to the same old way of life that you've always lived. Uh, Another way would be to hear this message and say, man, I've just got to work harder to be a better Christian. And I've just got to get to my act together. I'm just going to work really hard. And then the last one would be to just say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And that's where I hope you're at. You know, as I'm preparing for this message and, and just even wrestling with this for myself, like, that's it, isn't it? Like, when we're just aware of our sin, like, how can we stand before a holy God and pretend to be so arrogant and self-righteous that we think that we have no sin in our lives? The Bible tells us that if, if we say that we're without sin, then the truth is not in us. Like, we are sinful people. And, and yes, I love Jesus, I, I follow him, but I've got this flesh inside of me, and I don't always do the things that I know that I'm supposed to do. And there are times where I know I'm supposed to do something, and, and then I don't do it. Like, it's, it's real. The struggle is real. And if I think that I can stand before God because I've figured it out, and I'm a really good person, then I am mistaken. Because I am aching. You and I, we are aching. We fail to do the things that God tells us to do. And one day, we'll be held accountable. Someone will pay the price. And the difference between Achan and the difference between us is that we have the opportunity for someone else to pay the penalty for our sin. That we're sinful people, but guess what? God, who loves us, has offered to make it possible for that punishment, the eternal punishment, to be satisfied by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross. And so when we trust in Jesus, here's what happens. We trust in the sufficiency of the cross. That that what Jesus did on the cross was enough for even the worst of our sins. Isaiah 53 says, But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him For the iniquity of us all. Catch that. The Lord has punished him for our iniquity. Jesus bore the weight of our punishment on our behalf. And praise God for that. Because that is a bill that you and I cannot afford to pay. We can't. The other thing is that we trust in the promise of scripture. Romans chapter 10 says if you confess with your mouth. That Jesus is not only my Savior, but Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. And some of you are here this morning, and um, man, you're hearing all this, and you're trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And if you have not put your faith in what he accomplished on the cross, if you're still trying to do things in your own power, your own strength, your own effort, please, please, please don't leave here until you've, you've turned from that sin and trusted in the work of Jesus on the cross. If you have questions about that, we've got a great prayer team. At the end of the service, they'd love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus. And then finally, that we would trust in the goodness of God. And this is the secret, guys. This is the secret to defeating sin and temptation in our lives. If you have the Holy Spirit, you not only are freed from the penalty of sin, but you're freed from the power of sin. And you get to see sin, not in its darkness, but in the light, And you you compare that to the goodness of God and you think, why would I ever choose the things that this world says important when I can have the things that God has already told me and promised me that they're good? Why would I do that? Proverbs chapter 14 says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but in in, in the end, it leads to death. But its way is death. Listen, I, I was thinking about this message and couldn't help but think about the story that Jesus tells about a, a prodigal son. 
He grew up on his dad's ranch and he had everything that he could possibly imagine, but he says, you know what, I, I want what the world has to offer. And so he says, Dad, I want my inheritance early. I'm just going to take it. And so he, he takes his inheritance, goes off to the big city. He parties. He spends all of it until the point where he has no money left. And he literally finds himself in the pig slop, like face down in the mud. He has nothing left. And it's, it's the low moment of his life. And at that moment, he realizes, he says, listen, even the servants at my dad's house have it better than this. Maybe if I come crawling back to him, he'll let me back. And so he he gets up and he makes the journey home. And and on the way home, he's just rehearsing in his mind what he's going to say and how he he feels so sorry for what he did and how he's going to work to make it up for his dad. And he's just going to work for free and do all this. His dad sees him walking off in the distance, and the dad literally gets off the front steps and just comes running, and he embraces his son. He says, my son is home. And the son goes into the spiel, right? He he starts to talk about what he's been doing and feeling, and the dad's like, ah, you're home. You don't have to earn your way back. I'm just glad you're home. You're my son. You're my kid. And that's the picture this morning that I want to give you. I don't know where you've been. I don't know how far you've strayed. I don't know what sin's been in your life. But if you will turn from it, you have a heavenly father who is waiting to welcome you back. And you don't have to earn your way back. You don't have to have 10 weeks of perfect church attendance and volunteer in the nursery. You don't have to do any of that. Just come back to the Lord with all your heart. That is available. And it is so good. So good. So I'm going to give you some space to do that. If you don't mind, just bow your head for a moment. And just in the quietness of this room, if you just need some space to be with the Lord, to confess. Again, he's not surprised by any of these things. And in your heart, not only just confess it, but repent, which means to turn from it and say, God, I, I don't want any of this. I want your way. I want to be obedient. I want to do the things that you've called me to do. And then in a sense of desperation, whether you've known Jesus for for decades, or or you're just trying to figure this out, would you just say, God, I need your grace and your forgiveness? Like, you are my only hope of salvation. You're my only hope of forgiveness. Thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross. I believe it's sufficient for all my sins, past, present, and future. And you rest in that. Rest in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And then just celebrate that. Celebrate it. I want to give you that picture again of the son. He's still got mud all over his clothes. He is worn out. And he has nothing left in the tank. And he's walking home. And he sees the father in the distance. And the father comes running out. Listen, that, that's you. That's me this morning. The father welcomes us home. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. God, none of us deserve it. But we love you so much. God, help us to to fully turn to you and trust you. Follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.